Welcome to another episode of Bitcoin Tech Talk. My name is Jimmy Song, and you can always find this newsletter at jimmysong.substack.com. Taproot versus security threats. Bitcoin Tech Talk, issue number 267. Jameson Lobb wrote an article in Forbes about the different security threats to holding Bitcoin. By his reckoning, the biggest threats are accidental loss, digital theft, government seizure, physical theft, and inheritance planning. I've been writing code to upgrade the Biddle Python library to have Taproot support, so I read the article with some of the possible improvements in mind. After reading, I came to the realization that Taproot helps in each of these security threats. The biggest problem, by Jameson's reckoning, is accidental loss. Usually, wallets have some seed phrase that you can back up. This is done this can be done digitally, on paper, on steel, or even in your brain. But what if you lose both the wallet and the seed phrase? Is there a way to still access your coins? With enough foresight and planning, it turns out that you can add additional backup options. Taproot has, in addition to the normal single key spend, an option to add a whole set of different scripts that can also spend, called script spends. This means wallets can now give users more recovery options. Want to recover your UTXOs with a two of five multi-sig of five friends that don't know each other? You can do that. Want to recover your UTXOs after a time lock of one year and lock to a key belonging to a known service like Unchained or Casa? You can do that. Want to recover using a gracefully degrading multi-sig of three of your family members where three of three is for immediate recovery, two of three after six months, and one of three after a year? You can do that. Want to have all of them as options in the same UTXO? You can do that. Taproot essentially allows you to have as many alternative conditions for unlocking your Bitcoins as you want, making the addition of recovery options easy. Best part is that you only have to reveal the recovery method when you spend using it, so your friends don't even have to know that they're a part of your backup plan. You just have to present them with what needs to be signed. This means you have to back up and secure the taproot descriptor, but that's not nearly as catastrophic as leaking your private key, so you can store it in a less safe place. The second biggest security threat is digital theft. Because Taproot makes alternative recovery so easy, easy, it incentivizes users to hold their own keys. Having a fail-safe, like having two of three multi-sig using three different Bitcoin key services, should make people a lot more confident about holding their own Bitcoins. If the Bitcoins are then leaving exchanges, digital theft on exchanges is going to be much less a threat. As wallets integrate Taproot with different recovery options, I expect a lot more people to hold their own Bitcoins when they wouldn't before. The third biggest security threat is government seizure. This is far more likely if the coins are on an exchange. But as I've argued above, this is less incentivized in a Taproot future. Furthermore, even in a physical capture scenario, enough planning can make it impossible for government to seize the funds. The key path could be a three of three requiring your lawyer uh, from three different jurisdictions to agree to sign, which could be done in such a way that they wouldn't do so without seeing you in person. And the normal spend could be locked to your private key, but only after two years. Similarly, with physical seizure, planning with lock times in mind will make thieves wait on a lock time to expire even with your keys, while some while one of your recovery options can make it on chain first. For example, your UTXOs can have varying lag times, so your loss can be mitigated even in the worst case, while still giving you flexibility to spend some maximum amount. Wallets will have to design UIs that will take some maximum amount spendable into account and lock the rest in time locks to mitigate physical seizure. Lastly, inheritance planning becomes much easier as your UTXOs can be unlocked to your heirs after a certain amount of time. A will could simply be a taproot descriptor of your UTXOs, which are already distributed to your inheritor's keys. The details of taproot are still not fully understood by the developer community or the ecosystem in general. 
as they start to fully comprehend the benefits, it will be obvious that Taproot is a huge security improvement against all the threats that matter. So I wrote this article after uh, working on uh, integrating Taproot into the Bitcoin library that I've been maintaining with uh, Michael Flaxman. Um, and it turns out that there's a lot of different ways in which Taproot can help against all of these practical security threats, right? Like the things that people actually fear, um, stuff like, uh, you know, like accidental loss or digital theft or physical theft and stuff like that. You, you, you can actually design around those. It's just a matter of wallets essentially getting to the point where um, they're able to provide these uh, recovery options uh, it, it, within the wallet itself. So very exciting stuff. And I, I, I think it's a much greater security improvement or um, upgrade than I previously thought after thinking things through. Um, and I think a lot of wallet developers, as they play with this stuff, will agree. And um, I, I fully expect a lot more of this sort of service becoming a thing. Uh, let's talk about Bitcoin. Waxwing discusses how coin joins can be done right. The post goes into why cross input signature aggregation may not be the kind of coin join that we really need in order to preserve privacy. Then he gets into how an actual privacy preserving economically incentivized coin join would look like, including using lightning to pay certain parties to properly incentivize coin joins. The post is great for really understanding the difference between merely coin joining and really using it for privacy. So uh, really great discussion in that blog article um, talking about how CISA is not doesn't really preserve privacy because if you have a, a, sp a very large amount coming in and a very large com amount coming out, it's pretty obvious. Uh, because no no one else has that large amount within the coin join to know, hey, okay, that's that's who it is. And you can basically do something like Sudoku where you can eliminate certain outputs as being from a particular one and so on. Uh, and a proper coin join needs uh, you know similar amounts or something like that in order to make it work. Um, and that's what he discusses and how you incentivize that and so on. Aleko Fellini published how he made the first Taproot scripts men using the new Opcheck SIG ad opcode. The post goes through how he used Rust Bitcoin, Rust Miniscript, and a bunch of changes not merged into either project to create a two of two multi-sig script spend. The post is instructive for learning all the details of what goes into a script spend, particularly with Merkle paths and the new SIG hash default. Wallet developers are going to want to review this closely to understand ta taproot practicality. So um, I found that uh, post useful and I found his script it's been particularly useful because I had to code around the fact that there was one using SIG hash default and another using SIG hash all. Um, so I really appreciated that and I put that into my unit tests and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, there there are new things that you have to learn as a Bitcoin developer about SIG hash default, Merkle pass, object SIG add and so on. So very good post to learn all of that. Square has published the white paper for TBDEX, a protocol for decentralized exchange of Bitcoin, fiat, and real world goods. The main idea in the white paper is the use of decentralized identifiers and trust relationships using verified credentials to do trades peer to peer. The concept has been around a while with networks like BISC. The difference here is the use of DIDs to have some way of verifying that you have a path of trust between yourself and the other person. This is the answer to a very oft-repeated question of what if the government bans exchanges? The market is bound to start using something like this. So the idea behind the decentralized exchange is that you sort of find peers and so on, and that's what BISC does. Uh, and then you go meet them and, you know, do the actual uh, physical trade or something else. Um, the thing about uh, this thing, TB Dex, is that you do it in a very different way where you, um, well, it, it, I mean, it's a similar way, but you, you verify the trust using sort of like DIDs and uh, verified credentials. So you can, I, I guess, endorse somebody and basically then they become, uh, they come within your uh, trust circle or something like that. And then you can trade only within your trust circle or something to that degree. So interesting concept. And I'm glad that they published the white paper. And, um, you know, like 
I, I really don't like centralized exchanges for a lot of reasons. Uh, but uh, the, this should make sort of that peer-to-peer -peer layer much better. Galois, uh, let's talk about Lightning. Galois has a great blog post uh, on lessons learned from Bitcoin Beach. The post is a great overview of how we need to rethink Bitcoin in the context of non-first world countries. The people of El Zante simply don't have good banking services and Bitcoin, especially on Lightning, was a game changer. The main lessons like education being paramount are good ones as Lightning adoption expands in places with little to no banking services. So Galois, is, uh, they, they're involved in the Bitcoin Beach movement, and these are just some practical things that they learned. And I'm sure people that are doing similar things in Guatemala and Congo will want to read it. Blockstream researchers Warren Togomi and Konstantin Nick have published a deck on PeerSwap, a Lightning Network balancing protocol. The idea is that instead of trying to do something complicated like a coordinated balancing using many peers or opening new channels, the balance is simply paid on chain in exchange for the equivalent amount being shifted in the existing channel. This is a simple and elegant solution which Lightning node management software should consider. So. Um, balancing lightning channels as you use them up um, tends to be an important part of running a lightning node um, and they have a proposal to make it simpler um, and you know you can do something like a peer swap and um, essentially uh, you know rebalance channels uh, all right lnd 0.14 is out and it has some interesting new features the main one is the one i mentioned last week and that is reusable invoices this should be a major use case for recurring payments and given that lnd is very popular ln node software uh, this should allow many different node in a box manufacturers to have some sort of subscription model imagine for instance a human rights activist in iran being able to receive patreon like support for their efforts using lightning and no central authority being able to stop it. So I think that's ultimately where we want to get to with uh, something like reusable invoices is being able to fund uh, freedom fighters all over the world because you, you can just basically send them Bitcoin um, in a in sort of like a regular way um, and then being able to use like a decentralized exchange, kind of like the TD Dex, uh, TB Dex that, uh, that Square is working on. Um, and and being able to you know basically fight for freedom in those places um, and being funded from the outside basically economics engineering etc safety and argues for bitcoin from first principles in the wall street journal he dispels myths about bitcoin not being for everyone bitcoin being unreal bitcoin not being secure and bitcoin being unregulated the article coincides with the release of his new book the fiat standard as he explains these myths provide a tremendous amount of opportunity for those that understand Bitcoin. It's an excellent article to send to the financially minded. Um, so Safety obviously published the book. And I think as part of it, he had an article within the Wall Street Journal. Um, basically, uh, you know, there, there's an arbitrage opportunity because so many people don't understand Bitcoin and believe these myths um, that you can get in on and uh, profit from. Nick Baccia compares the various interest rates available inside and outside of Bitcoin. The post is a masterclass in understanding how banks actually work and why the repo rate is so crucial to how a bank does business. As he explains, the repo rate essentially allows the bank to make margin on money it does not have by pawning off U.S. Treasuries. The fact that a similar market in Bitcoin exists as a perpetual swap funding rate is strong evidence that Bitcoin is in the same class as U.S. Treasuries or real estate. It's a post wealth worth rereading to understand what the real market is actually like and why it's so leveraged. So um, Nick is obviously an expert in like how traditional markets work. And I, I thought his post was really explanatory of all of the things that are actually going on in the market, especially with respect to repo and real estate and things like that. El Salvador is planning a Bitcoin city. The main attraction will be zero capital gains taxes, zero income taxes, zero payroll taxes, and zero property taxes. The city will be funded purely through a value-added tax and a billion-dollar bond, which will be issued on the Lightning Network and traded on Bitfinex. 
This is very much like what Michael Saylor did with MicroStrategies, but on a nation state level. The city will be located near the geothermal power sources to provide energy and is probably in response to the $1.5 billion loan from the IMF that was thought to be in jeopardy due to making Bitcoin legal tender in the country. So this was an idea apparently that Max Kaiser, uh, you know, started with a tweet and uh, Nayib Bukele took it and actually made it happen, which is pretty impressive in of itself. Uh, but yeah, the billion dollar bond will be issued on the liquid network, traded on Bitfinex. Um, it'll have a 6.5% interest rate, which is way more than a lot of bonds right now. So it'll be of interest to a lot of people, especially since they'll be pu uh, pushing half of it right into, uh, you know, Bitcoin. So a very interesting idea, and they're going to make a Bitcoin city out of it. Um, lots of lots of things there, and I, I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more about it in the coming weeks. Speaking of El Salvador, Stefan Delorme has uh, several informative blog posts about Bitcoin in El Salvador. The first is about Bitcoin adoption as he traveled in the country. In the second, he complains that the UIs for wallets show balances too prominently. The third talks about the different wallets that he's found it found being used there. And the fourth is about the merchant experience. This is well worth reading. And for those that are interested in improving the UX, there's a whole UI toolkit for designing Bitcoin wallets. All right, Mark Goodwin explains that what the duck curve is in energy production and how Bitcoin is poised to combat it. The main problem is that solar energy tends to produce the least amount of energy just as the grid has need of it and vice versa. Most people are not home in the middle of the day when the solar panels produce the most energy and are thus not using energy and vice versa when the sun sets because they turn on their lights. As the article points out, governments have essentially meddled in those markets to make them look more attractive. Bitcoin, Goodwin argues, will turn this back to a market process. Reason opines that the environmental attacks against Bitcoin are fake news. Though much of what they say has been written in a lot of places, Reason is a major news outlet for libertarians, and it's good to see them defend Bitcoin. As they point out, the environmental attacks are losing steam and the elites are looking for other ways to attack Bitcoin. In other words, stay tuned. They got a lot more. We've got a lot more fighting ahead. Some quick hits. Marathon is getting into the issue bonds and buy Bitcoin game that Michael Saylor pioneered. Some senators are trying to reverse the crypto provision of the infrastructure bill. The IRS thinks they'll get billions. The development standards at altcoins are even worse than you think. Another week, another time when Bitcoin is pissing off the right people. Um, so all, all of those are stories that you can click through on. Uh, but the last one is about Hillary Clinton. I'm planning to be in London for the Advancing Bitcoin Conference at March 3rd and 4th, but there is some possibility I won't be able to get into the UK. I am also going to be at Bitcoin 2022 in Miami, April 6th to 8th. I'll also be doing the programming blockchain seminars in London, March 1st and 2nd, and Miami, April 4th and 5th. On this week's Bitcoin Fixes This, I talked to Lamar Wilson on uh, you know, Twitter Spaces. We talked about diversity, Bitcoin, and the changing nature of community we're finding ourselves in. I read through last week's newsletter, which you can find, and I did an AMA on Stacker News, so you can go read that if you want. I did a three-part series with Jean Rousey's on uh, Taproot. He might talk about who controls Bitcoin at the Human Rights Forum with Stefan Levera is up. I also talked about the Little Bitcoin book on AuthorCast. Finally, I was on the Steve D.A. show to, about, uh, to talk about the new book, Thank God for Bitcoin. My other books are the Little Bitcoin book and uh, Programming Bitcoin. Unchained Capital is a sponsor of this newsletter. I'm an advisor and proud to be a part of a company that's enhancing security for Bitcoin holders. If you need multi-sig, collaborative custody, or Bitcoin native financial services, learn more at Unchained.com. Fiat de Linda Est, this song is done.